Well, here we are on March 19th, 2024, and we're gathered together to remember, and we're going to do our best to remember our times on or in Mars. I suppose that most of the habitations in Mars over the recent years are probably inside the planet because of the devastation of the atmosphere. So who would like to start? Now, Tony, you uh, you had a time constraint, but I think that that's lifted now. So you have you have a couple hours to spend with us? Well, um, I'm mobile, so we'll see how the battery holds out. I'm on my phone, Zooming. Usually I have a, a, a much more built out. Hopefully you guys can hear me good. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, when the battery dies, I think I'm at like 90% here. Um, we'll see, like the Michael... Turn, well, I'm I'm figuring this out for the first time. So I was found myself on the road today, but I'm still. This is a great cast. So this is an epic roundtable with or without me, and I'm just happy to be here. So I'm glad I made it. But yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll stick around as long as I can. Awesome, man. I love I love your humility, and uh, I love the fact that you were taking a friend to the airport today. And I feel like I was in the shower and I was thinking, you know, Tony really is taking us all on helping us all on our journey because he's been going so deep and uh, I feel like he's our limousine driver. Um, our <laughs> limousine driver. So thank you, Tony Rodriguez. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, happy to be, it's an honor. Awesome. Awesome. Well, who, who feels like going first? I mean, I, I'm looking for the biggest smile because I figure that's the one who wants to jump in. Oh, Jessica's always, she's always got the biggest smile. Jessica, do you want to start? Do you have any memories of a, a life uh, on or in Mars or a parallel life uh, on or in Mars? Yes. Okay. So this is the first and only time I've ever talked about this publicly. And pretty much the first time I've ever talked about it with anybody other than the, the guys who are on my remote viewing team, who we actually have discussed remembering living on Mars together, uh, which is interesting because I... I was thinking that I, you know, I have flashes. I have memories of living in Egypt and those memories of being in Egypt kind of overlap with Mars, I believe. And what I believe was were lives in Egypt were actually lives on Mars. Okay. So I've always had this, this feeling, I guess you could say that people on Mars moved here and that that's what the Egyptians were. Okay, I think Egyptians are Martians. And that's just something I don't know for sure if that's what it is. But whenever I'm in meditation uh, and, and in my dream state, um, I have these memories. Okay, I have memories. I have, it's like, I, it's almost like a movie playing out and uh, my past lives uh, for sure. But yeah, you know, I, I can't say that I remember a lot of people that, um, that I work with personally or that I that are in my life right now, other than my remote viewing team, for sure. Some of those guys there, and we're a very close knit group, but we all, not all of us, but several of us remember each other and we believe it was from life on Mars. Yeah. So. We, you know, we have some Intel that Mars used to be a satellite of Tiamat, which is now academia's asteroid belt. I don't know if Tony or anybody else, or Tyler or anyone here has any uh, corroborating intel on that. But I think that um, Alex Collier has said that it was 69.3 million years ago that a large planet-sized asteroid came through our system with dragging other bodies behind it, other asteroids behind it. And one of those shards hit the Earth and destroyed the dinosaurs. So it was 69.3 as opposed to Academia 65 million years ago that the dinosaurs were destroyed. Um, but that's pretty close. Good job, Academia. Um, so 69.3 million years ago, this planetary body came in and and he doesn't, Alex Collier doesn't specifically say that this body hit Tiamat and destroyed it, but that's the implication. And in that destruction, Tiamat, um, Tiamat's moon, Mars, was moved 19 million miles to a different orbit. So instead of orbiting a planet, it was orbiting our sun as a planetary body. And so the, the so Martians, 
um, in Egypt, I think that makes sense because from other insiders' testimonials, we have the um, the, the story of Tiamat royal refugees coming here after the explosion of their planet. They were able to survive. The royals did. Everyone else, all the slaves died. But the royals had the intel, and they they their spaceship came here and cr crash landed in um, Antarctica, and they they started a, a, a camp in in Cairo. They basically basically played the game of kings in in Cairo, and they enslaved humanity. There are different species, and they enslaved humanity, and they weren't beloved kings, and we didn't build tombs for beloved kings. Um, they didn't build pyramids. They found pyramids there, so that you could call them Martians if the Martians. Um, if the people on Mars when it was orbiting Tiamat were the same people as the the, uh, the Tiamat royal race with the little pot belly and the elongated skulls. Wow. Well, you know, part, part of the things that we, we kind of remember when we talk about our being in like the priest and priestess class, it kind of is what we were, we were, it was some sort of, it was some sort of almost, it felt I don't, I don't want to say important, but it, it felt like there was something to it, you know, and it's almost like we have agreed to keep coming back and reincarnating uh, for special moments such as this. OK, what what we have going on in the world right now, uh, you know, we it, it's almost like we're, we do this. This is not our first rodeo here. OK, so right. uh, but uh, but I do have memories of being on Mars. Well, when you were talking with your remote viewing friends, what kind of scenes were you seeing? Were you seeing the actual people? Were you seeing yourself among friends there inside or on the surface or where were you? Yeah, well, I, th I thought it was it looked very much like what we would consider to be Egypt, you know, uh, Egyptian pyramids. I mean, I, I remember seeing pyramids and stuff. It was very like it was royal. OK, it felt very luxurious and um High class, I guess you could say. Were you a royal? <laughs> it felt classy. I, I believe. I believe there was something important going on. Yes, I don't know. For, I, like I said, like a priest priestess class kind of thing. Well, mm -hmm. as Alex Collier says, uh, you know, we we're all we're all sovereigns, and that's what we're learning right now in the transition from the old Earth, the the Matrix, the thought control Matrix, to New Terra, where we. We all claim our sovereignty, so we're no longer going to have to live as slaves. And and so, um, it, it, when we say were when I say were you a royal, uh, that that might have had a different meaning back then. But these days, w we understand that we're all we're all royal in the sense that we we, we are not um, we don't we don't have to um, have other people. Uh, transgressing our boundaries as a part of our daily lives we, we can set our boundaries and be sovereigns upon the earth that's that's our birthright so we've lived as slaves um, our whole our whole lives and so have our forefathers and foremothers and we we're, we're tired of that and it's not going to happen anymore this is the new the new era so um royals we're, we're all royals and mm -hmm. uh, alex collier says that we have uh, we are considered to be genetic royalty by the Andromedans and by other advanced races because so many races have come and given us their genes. Mm -hmm. And so we are a repository. We're essentially a library. Now, he also says that Earth and Mars were originally designed to be terrariums. That wasn't his word exactly. That's my word. But he said uh, genetic libraries uh places where the biospheres could be experiments experimentation areas and life forms would be brought here see how they did same with mars so does it does anyone have any memories of of life forms on mars uh and i don't want to you know uh, give any specific examples because i want you guys to to, to search your memories and, th and and give us uh any uh, images you have from the past Oh, oh, hi, hi, Abby. <laughs> so, so the, I actually don't have anything new to add, but, but I, I'm going to try to like pinpoint both of what you and Jessica were speaking about of something that I have, that I have seen. So yeah. when I was doing a, uh, a regression session, I saw that this being, and it matched up jock, 
I, cause I saw myself with the pot belly, extremely tall beings and the memory started being in a craft and, you know, I saw all, you know, they were all engineers, um, just layman's people. And they are coming here with a very distinct mission, a distinct purpose and, and a sense of urgency as well. So, but the whole purpose of them coming here and Jessica and, and I was in Egypt, I know I was, but there was no, there were no pyramids there. There was, there was nothing, but there was already an existing race here. Um, but very, very low IQ, very, but again, I was looking at through the perspective of an advanced race being, um, but the entire purpose of them building what we now consider the step pyramids was to quickly terraform this planet. That's the whole purpose. So they were coming here, laying the groundwork, which would coincide, Jock, with what you were kind of talking about for a, for a race of beings to come here because they needed to accelerate the plant life here. And it was also about accelerating um, the form of oxygen coming here. There wasn't enough of that here. And so he was explaining to me um, as, as best as he could, so I could understand it, how these pyramids worked and it created, it, it ionized the atmosphere and it would make the, the, the floor and the fauna much larger and greener, but there was no greenery at all where I was at. And so and it was Egypt everywhere. I looked, um, there was not in a sketch of greenery. Um, it was very hard to live here. Very, very hard to live here. Um, for them, the gravity was so different. It was hard for him to walk and to move. And I could feel the breath, like, <gasps> like you know, just bringing in, um, that was very hard on their bodies. They were never meant to stay here, never meant to procreate with anything. They have very strict laws about that. And then the person who I went in, they broke that law because they're so lonely and procreated. And that's why he could never go home. They, like, he was never allowed to go back and they left him here which then went into, and I saw the line of a pharaoh, like it, but yeah. Well, Samuel Zmanigich, the discoverer of the Bosnian pyramids, says that astonishingly, uh, there are 100,000 pyramids on our planet. Yes. Now, academia would tell us, uh, would mention a few pyramids, but they're not going to tell us there are, there are that many because then we'd have to start wondering what exactly was going on. Whereas if there are just a few, they can say, oh, it was primitives dragging stones around and building tombs for beloved kings, which, of course, is absolute utter nonsense. Um, uh, Christopher Dunn has uh, told us with Giza Power Plant that the uh, pyramids were energy machines. But, Tony, what, what were you going to say? Nothing yet. You keep going. Um, oh, I, thought, I, I saw your hand go listen. up. Maybe you were reaching for an invisible. I put my sun visor down. Well, Tony <laughs> does have. Visor down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If anyone so, has, he'd be able to answer your question of seeing beings on Mars. I was on Mars. So physically on Mars, uh, right around uh, 1988 or 89. Uh, it was right in those years and uh, there for a short time and set foot on the surface. So there were insectoids that were ranged from different types that were very small to very large, you know, bigger than us. And I did interact with one on one occasion. So that was real. And since I've had my memories back and since I've gone through that, I've been in contact with people like sex. Like I look up at Mars in the night sky. I'm, you know, I'm aware of where it's at and um, wonder what, if that thing that I met is still alive and wonder what they're up to. Like I look at it with a feeling of, um, you know, there's people up there. So it's not just a blip in the night sky. It's a reddish star in the sky. But really, I know that there's, uh, you know, I remember what it looks like. And I remember that there are people that there, are, it was an insectoid, but it was a very advanced um, thing. And, you know, I, I struggle for the words to say, but it was like a, uh, there was an acquaintance. We acquainted our, we was a, it was a combat situation. Like I was badly wounded, but it, there was a, there was a communication you know, with another being there, another species. And so I wonder what they're up to now. And uh, so we we have to think in terms, I mean, you can stand out in your backyard and find Mars and Jupiter and Saturn, all the planets and look at them. But you, when you look at Mars, you have to think in terms that there are millions of life forms there now. And there are people there now. So when you look up, when you look up, it's not, it's not a dead sky that we look at. It's populated. 
and uh, there's a lot of life life there still. I mean, as we speak, uh, all all disasters aside, I want to say one thing that we did hiking missions out on the surface, and there was you know a one time instance where we saw ruins. And they were they were not fancy. You know how when you go to the beach or you go to the river and people stack rocks up on top of each it was like that, but very big because the gravity, there's lesser gravity. Um, and so the rocks were very big and very stacked up. And the wind is the wind blows quite a bit, but it's a weaker density wind. It doesn't just blow, you know, it doesn't just blow you over when it's flying really fast. It's it's dense, it's a lesser density. So the rocks were there, and we asked the soldiers like what's up with these and he said under no circumstances touch it that they've been there for million millions of years that they had they had archaeologists come and look at them and those rocks that it was a wall like a round wall and then it had columns of rocks in the center that were piled up and they were they were very they were jagged almost like volcanic rocks they didn't look like the rocks that were laying around they were a separate kind of rocks mm. and he said don't touch them they've been there for millions of years and he you know, you hear stuff like that it was a long time ago for me in double, but you know, you hear the facts and it's like, it's in one, one ear and out the other when somebody tells you a statistic, uh, you know, and so I don't really remember a whole lot about that, but I I do remember that it was pretty impressive to be around something that old, you know, it's just impressive to be around something very old, an old structure. So that's what I remember from that. But um, I, uh, when the rovers went and they send the pictures back from Mars, it's like I I had the memories kind of before the rovers were sent. And I said, yeah, that's exactly. I remember we had like a cleated shoe, and a lot of the a lot of the places you stand are hard hard rocks with sand over it. So it's like it was like having cleats like a cleated shoe and walking on rocks was what it was like. So there are places that had deep sand sand dunes, but um, for the most part, it's a rocky surface. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else have memories of uh, life forms, uh, particularly insectoid life forms on, uh, on or in Mars? Not insectoids, but I do want to add to something Tony said about the ruins. So I don't know. I, I'm terrible with names. Carrie Cassie interviewed this whistleblower who claimed to be part of a um, an excavation team on Mars. They were going to Mars to excavate the ruins and and they were specifically in the Cydonia area with the pyramids in the face and and he confirmed a lot of that information. And so that's absolutely what it is. And and they found human artifacts, like all kinds of artifacts, similar to stuff that we would find on Earth, as if modern humans had been there also, not just an ancient civilization. And there was a lot that he couldn't share. And I don't remember much of that interview, but you might want to, uh, if I find it, I'll send it to you, Jack. You'd probably be fascinated by it. But uh, he was there confirming those runes, if, if that testimony is accurate well abby do you feel like um we talked about this earlier and you said there was a possibility you might want to do a sound activation does it feel right for you to do that for us <laughs> um not not quite yet i um so i do i i've been sitting here doodling that's what i do um and when i'm tapping in into mars it just for me, I, I just, I'm hearing words coming in and it's almost as though it is another outpost. I keep getting the word outpost. It's just another outpost, very similar to the moon, but it's not. I mean, the moon is more like a satellite base, but Mars, and I have, I have split second memories of being places. And the mission was always a feeling of, they were searching for something that was left behind. And only certain people know what this is. And when I'm going, it's like I'm going in deeper. It's almost a form of technology. I know that's kind of like an easy thing to throw out there, but it is a form. It's a form of a technology that is only powered by a certain substance. But again, these missions are going out there because they're looking for something that ancestors, ancestors going back is what they're telling me knows that is there and is left behind and Tony, this probably makes sense to you. It is being guarded by natives that are there. There's something naturally there and they are guarding that. So a memory that I have is being up against this rock. And this this came through, it just plays like Jessica said, the plays like a movie. And I'm in this complete armored gear and I'm looking across and I see this individual and I know who this individual is. I've contacted him, um, but I see him 
And I just know, I just look at him, I go, are you ready? And my only concern was him to make sure that he is safe. Cause he was like my little, my little brother. Right. I've known him since I was very, very, very young. And, um, again, I knew like we were just going out. It was supposed to be very quick and out, but again, we are looking, we are looking for a substance to bring back, but it was very dangerous. And I woke up a few weeks ago. I actually shared this with Tyler. He's the only person I shared it with. I had a memory and um, I was fully awake and it just came back so clearly. And I'm wondering if anybody here can relate to this or if any of the listeners can. So it, it was me, but not me. Um, I mean, it was me, but I was all of a sudden like sitting there and I was going like, I was going like this on my arm and I was feeling, cause I had just put on pants and a top and um, the outside of it. I loved it. I loved how it felt. Cause it was like a million teeny, teeny, tiny, like little rubber grips, right. Just all over it. And you could just very finely do this and you could very barely see them move. Um, and then when you went on the waistband, there was this, it was like a button, but it wasn't like something where you could tangibly touch. So there was a sensor there. And so then I, I went on that symbol. And when that happened, everything that was on the surface, it was all black, by the way, it, it, it like, it like, inverted like this went voom, 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 like this on the entire suit and the top and the bottom became as almost like the top went and it and it looped it and all these tiny little suctions went in and it tightened on the entire body so you were very um uh, not squeezed in but supported it supported your entire body but i also knew like and i like and once it was inverted i could like i could do this and i always had like a matte finish but there's also a very, very faint uh, design like on it. But I knew that even though it felt weightless on my body, it completely hugged every muscle on my body in. It was very flexible, but it was tough as all get out. There was like no way could you have slashed it. It was tough as nails. It was like armor, but it was a suit essentially so, on it. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that felt it can relate to it. That's exactly, so when I had my QHHT session and I found myself in a life on Mars, that's exactly what we were wearing. You know, in the session when they, they ask you like to look at your feet, works on your feet and everything, once I realized I was in a suit identical to what you described uh, exactly, almost. Yeah, and what was cool, I, I, I like it when it comes in as just a blatant memory. Again, it was like it just dropped in and it was just there and I was reliving that moment. And again, when I was, I was maybe in my early 20, like 2021 20, was what I felt like when I was looking at this. And uh, yeah, there's a reason why I shared that with you, Tyler. Yeah, I, <laughs> I but, you but you didn't that. share that much detail in the text. So it didn't, it didn't even, I didn't relate until just now. Yeah, yeah. So well, did and, it, did, I'm sorry, did, did Tyler, did it feel like, um, or, or Abby, did it, did it feel like a suit that was um, like a life support kind of suit or is it more just a, a, a lightweight armor? Armor, armor. My, the one armor. I had felt like it was a life support, like it was feeding me nutrients, like and like it would keep me hydrated, and I wouldn't need to eat and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, while the, I was go ahead, Tony. I was gonna say the environment suit. So we had regular clothes inside the base, regular clothes, but the environment suit we wore was the most comfortable thing I've ever worn ever that I can ever remember it was the most comfortable clothing and it was like you said Abby it, it had the ability it adapted to you mm -hmm. to yeah. your individual size and it was an environment suit so it was white we were, ours were white the soldiers had like an adaptive camouflage theirs could change colors uh, and an armor they had an armor on and this was like a very like a rubbery Kevlar like a super tough you couldn't cut it but it was like it was rubbery and uh, it would adapt with you in the shoes and everything. It was literally the most comfortable thing I'd ever worn. It was, it, I remember, like, I don't remember exactly how it worked or how, what it felt like, but I remember that, that sensation of like, wow, I've never worn anything this comfortable mm -hmm. that it, it, it moved with you just like your skin. Yeah. It did. The thing that s shocked me the most was that I didn't, the, the shoes or the suit went around my feet like socks and there weren't actual shoes on. It was just like, you would, it looked like my feet should hurt, like walking on the hard ground, but I couldn't feel it. Like it was that protective. 
and it just hugged my feet. So, I mean, obviously we're all talking about different memories and different whatever stuff. I'm just talking about same technology hypnosis. Yeah. But the same kind of te- same level of technology that made the clothes. It's the same, right. fa- you know, craft. And did you guys remember, like, did it, was it coming up and then was it around your head? Was there a helmet around your head or what? Because if your feet were protected, were you, were you also protected up here? I had a helmet. We, we had an open face helmet that came, oh. it had a, like a, like a, it had like a half cone that came out around it and it would, there was oxygen that would, that would come when you exerted yourself, it would blow oxygen. But I think that, I think that we had implants that helped us breathe the air as well in our lungs. Like I think we had mechanical things that we were adapted for. Like I was rated for different kind of atmosphere um, that from was done surgically. That's, that's, that's my best guess. You know, I know it wasn't early on that I called that out in my testimony, but you know, when I look back on it, I think that we were altered in some way to breathe better in that, you know, to help us. And, but I know that the suit had oxygen and when, when you'd run or jog or exert yourself, it would squirt oxygen up and you'd breathe it. Right. The body, the body suit itself went like mid, like mid up on my neck right there. But the helmet was separate. Like when I went out, the head, the helmet was separate and it had like a, the, it was a black helmet, but it had this yellowish type of visor that like completely went down for me. Well, it's interesting that rubber or something like rubber would be used for this because you would think that if we did that here on Earth, the technology would keep would immediately make us start sweating and would be really detrimental to us. But somehow this sounds like a really high tech um, material that maybe feels like rubber, but is or incorporates rubber, but has some uh, gives you the ability to, to have breathability through the through the material. I, otherwise, we it would be detrimental. I think. No, it's it's not a it's not a substance that's found here on Earth. I I just feel that it's we can't reproduce it here. Right. Well, now Lily Nova, you've said that you have experienced uh, flashes from a parallel life on Mars. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So this happened uh, in the beginning of my journey, whenever I'm just experimenting with meditation and making contact, being contacted by all these different beings. And I didn't really know anything about Mars at the time. I didn't know anything uh, about the secret space program either. And I was contacted three different times by um, another uh, lifetime of mine, a male. Uh, His name is Genova, to my understanding. And he, uh, he was on Mars. And he wasn't wearing like a space helmet or anything like that. And I thought this was a past lifetime and and originally, and it felt like he was just kind of contacting me to, I guess, teach me a little bit about, you know, that you can make contact with these, these parallel versions of you because time is all happening, you know, at once and in that, you know, life is possible on Mars and, and we have been on Mars And uh, right before this, I tuned in to, because I hadn't seen him in a while. And um, I actually, I asked, tried to kind of get a gauge of like what time period or, you know, where he was coming from. And I actually felt from the future. And I started to see um, Mars still like red and and rocky. But then I started to see these uh, very shiny silver cities uh, that had been built and then I started seeing like you know like shrubbery and green so uh, so yeah he's actually from the future and um, I saw a portal uh, opening up from earth and to Mars like we would be easily you know moving back and forth between the two which in the SSP I guess that's already happening like now anyways we just don't know about it Uh, but I guess that that'll be a more open thing so yeah, I just uh, found out that he's from the future and I sensed, um, I was also sensing some insectoid uh, being. So I wanted to ask Tony about that more too, but um, yeah, so that's what I got about that. I also have a little bit of uh, secret space program memories that are just starting to come through, but that's been my initial uh, experience with Mars. Well, I just had a reading with uh, Vanessa Lyle She's got Vanessa Crystal Consciousness on YouTube uh, and March 8th, I had a reading with her, probably the 12th reading I've had. 
And she mentioned that Mars is considered by the ant people, and then she calls them the ant people. She doesn't call them giant ants, which is also another way of looking at them, but she calls them people, and she says they're very good people. Uh, Mars is considered by them to be their planet. She says, if you're not an insectoid, uh, you're just visiting as far as the insectoids are concerned. <laughs> so um, so I think ins insectoids probably play a large part in this. And for people who have never heard of this or who have never believed in ETs or anything, this might be really out there for you. But in general, the intel that I've heard is that there are a few insectoid races, uh, including giant ants, giant mantids, they're all intelligent, very, very intelligent races, and um, the mantids are um, extremely advanced genetic engineers. And there's also um, giant spiders, which are, I guess, not technically insects, uh, arachnids, but uh, they're there. And much to be feared, uh, the secret space program insiders say, much to be feared. And they live in caves on the surface of Mars. And so we have a few races um, living with each other. And then the, the, the humans come from Earth and some, some uh, 200,000 recruits were brought to Mars by the secret space program. And then they had children. And now there's about a million humans from Earth uh, working in slave conditions for the, the dark faction of the secret space program. And they're trapped there. And, and it's it's going to be our job probably to free them because we're going to be freed first is the idea. So, but anyway, getting back to the insectoids, uh, the ant people regard Mars as their planet. So um, does anyone have any uh, thoughts on the, the life forms on Mars, the intelligent life forms that are um, inhabiting Mars? Well, I wanted to ask, um, bringing up that, Abby, you mentioned s sensing that somebody was there like protecting something. Do you think that could be the insectoids and in? some of the, in, you know, intelligent? Absolutely. Things? Yeah. It, yeah I mean, that's it, what I was thinking. Yeah, it would be the native species because it's, it, I mean, it'd be just like us if someone came here and us guarding our goal. I mean, it's what's natural, naturally occurring on our planet. It's mm -hmm. the same type of thinking. Right. Yeah. I think the movie Starship Troopers kind of indicates that too. The insectoids on the other planets are being native mm -hmm. to the other planets. Uh, if you guys have seen that movie, it's a like total disclosure of the SSP, in my opinion, also. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That, right. That's what I get in my YouTube comments. He just saw Starship Troopers. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, he just saw that he's making this all up, but it's... Um, oh. I remember them, they looked a lot different than that. The briefing that I got and from other people um, that have come forward is that the the insectoids are not one form of insect, that they actually, it's a hive mind. And the feeling that I got from it, or the briefing that we got was that when they die, because they have a hive, central hive mind, they, they, don't, they don't experience death like we do. It's like they have a server and then they're like, they, they can genetically make a new set of insects to do a job. So they can make insects that dig holes. And then, so they'll kill off a bunch of them. And then these other insects, they can genetically alter their makeup. So in other words, they can make a beetle, a bunch of beetles. They can kill off a thousand of their own insects that those consciousness goes through via the hive mind and back into the new beetles that will go and dig the hole. And then they will kill them off and builders. So they're not just ants or spiders or beetles. It's whatever the hive needs at the time. They can genetically alter what is going to be born. They're very adaptable that way. So some of them are made um, to uh, to fight or to explore or build or gather, and they can kill off a part of them. They don't they don't see death the way that we do because they're a hive mind. Mm. Yeah. Well, you know, I don't have specific memories of a life on Mars, but three readers have said that I was a record keeper, essentially a librarian for paper and metal scrolls and texts there in one life and perhaps in another life was working with scientists from Alpha Centauri who were trying to analyze the atmosphere and they were in a sort of a bunker, not, not a very fancy um, habitation uh, under the surface of the earth and, you know, collecting samples from the air and trying to figure out how to rejuvenate the atmosphere after the devastation uh, of the atmosphere. Um, so, um, my my memories are are not uh, intact at all, but 
but the, the readers are, I'm, I'm trying to get the, the, basically the readers are helping me to have, have places to start in trying to figure all this out. And that was one of the reasons I wanted to have this, this round table was because I feel like for me and for, for all of you too, and perhaps for many of the people listening, we have um, rudimentary memories of past lives that could be activated or, you know, we could, um, we could begin to remember more about what happened and that might be good for us. That might be really good for us to remember because we've been stuck in this slave matrix for so long where we're controlled to believe that when we die, that's the end and we go to become worm food. And then, you know, that's not a, that's not a good system for people because it's just basically a system of fear. But when we begin to realize that we are mortal souls who are living different lives throughout uh, this long um this this uh this long life uh that's beyond the material then this is really positive and this is really good so i think it's i think remembering that we have past lives is is is, is super important for us uh, in general just to give us a more positive outlook because if otherwise we're just going to think oh i'm going to die soon and that's the end and that's that's kind of sad and, and i don't want humanity to be sad anymore so um i mean i i believed in I didn't believe in souls until I started to get testimonials from secret space program insiders, you know, so that this is the, 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 the and uh, Tyler's uh, journey to truth podcast, Tyler and Aaron's podcast has helped me a lot because these insiders have given so much great intel. So um, what do you guys think? Do you, uh, Jessica, do you want to uh, chime in? Do you, do you uh, have any memories that are coming back right now? I mean, it's so interesting because the things that I I would consider to be Mars, you know, and like, you know, I don't I don't have proof that this was Mars, but I intuitively, you know, I picked up that this was on Mars. Um it's it sounds so different from it's like a, a different age on Mars than what you guys are talking about with some some of like the spacesuits and all that kind of stuff. It's a little different because that's not what I kind of like recall. So I just think it's fascinating. Like all this is super fascinating, but um, no, I mean, I'm, I'm not really picking up anything brand new, like any, any kind of, I'm not having any kind of memories or anything coming back right now, other than what I, what I had already known about it. Gotcha, gotcha, so, gotcha. Well, yeah. well, Mars has such a varied history. Um, Abby, what do you think? <laughs> so it's not, this isn't necessarily about Mars, but we're talking about souls and we're talking about different planets. Um, I, I was doing this, this reading for a client and they, they said, what was the first lifetime that I experienced in a physical body and knowing how the quantum works and going into the Akashic, I, uh, this, I was suddenly seeing this life. And again, it was the first time that the soul had chosen to take a physical being and because it didn't, they didn't want it to be too jarring. All of a sudden I was on this moon-like planet and this species, they lived completely below the ground and they did not speak. They are all telepathic. And what was so interesting about that was that the soul chose that to be the first because it was still so closely aligned to almost being a light being because everything was telepathic. And this species, they actually didn't even consume food. This, this species knew how to, through daily meditations, daily connecting in, they were, their bodies were able to absorb essentially food through the atmosphere. And so that, you know, they weren't having the stresses of looking for sustenance and hunters and gatherers and all of that jam. Um, but again, it was, I was on a moon. I can't recall. They did tell me the name of the species that it was, um, it's in my notes somewhere. And, um, and I saw this entire lifetime and it was extremely interesting. So kind of like Jessica, you know, it was like, it was very primitive. Um, I don't know what moon <laughs> I was on, um, but it was just very, it was intriguing to me to see. Well, it could have been because, uh, because Mars was a moon of Tiamat uh, from, from the Intel that I've, that I've gotten. So uh, I don't know if you guys have any Intel on that, but because, you know, I, I'm obviously not the last word on any of this. Um, so please correct me if, if any of this doesn't sound right to you, but that's the Intel I have. So you, you might've been on that moon, uh, which we now call Mars. 
Mm -hmm. um, but Mars, like I say, has had such a varied history. And uh, so um, Alex Collier says that for 3.8 billion years, advanced races have been using Mars as a colony before they then uh, jump off to some other uh, solar system or some other galaxy. So uh, you can imagine how much stuff has gone on on that planetary body. So uh, it will, it, you know, it, it would be really highly unlikely that any of us would have memories from the exact same time period there. But then again, if, if we live successive lives over millions and millions of years, that's a lot of lives. So maybe we would, we would be able to tap into some similar memories. But, and it's amazing that you guys have the, the intel on the on the uh, the bio suit or the the armor suit that's that's made of this rubber like material. It's fantastic that we have that correspondence. I'm really glad that we have that. So um, so Lily, you know, you, you've talked about this this life where you've lived in the future on Mars. Is this you're saying that um, one day in the future you're going to be this this fellow? That's what it would seem so. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so that was like brand new, like digging in deeper uh, right before this. Um, so I'd love to like dig into that more. But yeah, that's what I was getting. And he and he was saying like it's an it's in a in another dimension. In a higher dimension. Like I don't know how. Fifth, fifth or higher um, where this city is. This it was kind of like a silver metallic looking city. Um and I don't know what time period exactly. Um, well, I didn't get too much time to like dig into it, but yeah, that's what that's what I'm picking up. But I do believe that I have had past lifetimes there too. Um, I just haven't gotten into, haven't uh, had any of those come up. More recently, uh, the secret space program stuff has started coming up, having to do with Mars for me. So you know, it's interesting you you mentioned the dimensions because that a few different people talk about like Kerry Cassidy had a whistleblower on he said that the Mars that people remember from the secret space program is actually from another dimension and he said the jump the jump room was in Texas that he knew of anyway take it all with a grain of salt but then there was that Area 51 whistleblower the anonymous one in 2008 who said that our shadow government um, knows of a number of dimensions and they have developed the ability to to traverse dimensions and they said in each dimension, the planets take on different forms. One, It may be a gas giant in the third dimension, and it'll be a completely colonized planet in the fourth dimension, and, and, and crystal cities in the fifth dimension, whatever. And so who's to say that all, all these memories that people are having aren't actually from other dimensions as well mm -hmm. and other parallel lifetimes? So right. it's all possible, I think. Like mine, whenever I had my uh, QHHT session, with Allison Co. Actually, I wasn't. I had. You have no idea what's going to come up in a session, right? It's just you have no idea. So, I found myself in Mars, but it seemed like it was a parallel life, or even currently, like something. I don't know. It was weird. It felt like the here and the now, like somehow it was doing both simultaneously. If it was, maybe it was some form of twenty and back. I have no idea. But uh, I found myself in a canyon in a dome like a like a bubble like a domed uh canyon not a crater it was a canyon and there was it was very quiet we had just i had just landed there like we had came by ship and uh i was there to meet somebody and there was a facility or it was a round white building only a couple stories high and i was walking to the facility i walked in and completely futuristic and in the sense that it's just it looked like something from a sci-fi movie and to get to the second floor i had been there before like in the memory i knew i had been there i, I knew where i was going i knew my way around and i knew i was meeting somebody but when i walked into the building there's in the center of the building is this pad on this circular pad on the floor that was like blue and it was illuminated and all and there was a hole in the floor and the, above for the second floor and all you did was walk into the pad and you were just elevated, like you levitated up. That was the elevator. You just walk onto it, and all of a sudden, you're on your way up. And then you just walk off, and you're on the second floor. And I met somebody, and it was a blonde woman wearing all white, taller than me. And there was we were in, exchanging information, 
and then I left and went back to my ship and I realized once I was on the ship what I was actually doing on the ship and it was like we were stationed basically uh, we were monitoring all of the <clears throat> all of the reptilian control on the globe and all was we we're almost acting like air traffic control as well monitoring all the incoming and exiting traffic but in particular the reptilian control and what tactics they were using and what areas and if they were using like the chemtrails or mind control gases or mind control frequencies or how they were manipulating this civilization in this country we were monitoring everything and, and we knew it was going on and as actually we there was nothing we could do is a very much of an understanding like we couldn't do anything about it there was some treaty that had been made a long time ago and what my job was was we like i was part of this i don't know think tank this group that was um, in in negotiations with a new peace treaty with these reptilians and and they were in particular we were monitoring this area over british columbia that, that they were they were using this like new portal that they had it's like it's like whack-a-mole they always find new ways in right and they were they were coming in over British Columbia and we were trying to shut that down and I was in negotiations with them I was like yo like your time is up it's time to go and they were like pleading for an extension and they knew that their time was up and anyway and like and they like they all hated me because I was like making these decisions that you know to, to tell them like things they didn't want to hear right so it was very interesting, but there was like in that it, it was it was like a space station and there was it was like a huge server room and there was like hard drives, but this like crazy type of hard drive that we wouldn't recognize that was all it was always being updated in real time. Like anyone that would come and go from the planet, every group that was here and everything they were doing, it was like just almost like an Akashic record type of thing, but it was more of like an AI version of it. And all the drives were just like hovering in like the stasis thing. And you can like reach in and, and pull it out and like update it and put it back. But it was very interesting. It was very interesting, all of it. So my time on Mars was just like a visit. I was visiting somebody on Mars in that building to exchange some information. But this is all through QHHT, right? This isn't some like random memory that just came back to me. This all came through hypnosis session. And I don't talk about it that much because it's not like an actual memory. You know what I mean? Like stuff that comes through QHHT, you listen to it and you're like, did I make that up? Is that is that real? Whatever. So uh, I don't really share it that often. But since we're here talking about it, um, yeah, that's, that's what I remember. It's, you Ooh. know, so it's interesting that about this server. So I was actually, I was doing a session with Laura Van Tyne and um, they, I, again, it's hard to find words to explain this, right? I think that's part, probably one of the hardest things to do um, because your soul understands the technology, but they, um, they do, there is something above the firmament, whatever you want to call it, that's around our planet that they can literally like the minute a soul come chooses to come down here before we're even in a body, you've already tripped off the sensor. You, they're, they're already on you and right. they know when you come down here. So it was it, very interesting to see. Yeah. And another thing I remember specifically was in the negotiations, for some reason, Mars was off limits at the time in my memory, was off limits to many groups because it was on the brink of like a civil war. And there was, they were trying to like keep things under control. So they like, you had to have specific access you had to have like clearance to get onto Mars. And it wasn't just like any way anyone could come and go at that time. Now this is all, who knows if it's even real, right? I don't know. I'm just here sharing it because that's the conversation. That's the topic today, but. Yeah. That's exactly what it was like when, when I was there, the airspace was contested though. You, there were several factions. It was very ter territorial and we, you could, we couldn't just fly anywhere. Like I remember that that was an issue. We waited in an orbit to land and we went from, one place to another we had to get permission and watch out where they were flying they could get shot down so there was there was contested there wasn't just one group that was in charge of everything mm. yeah Tyler would you remember if, if you were in the position of a diplomat or were you more like a scientist no very much of like a diplomat it felt like I was a representative or something I mean I don't know what my I have no idea what my title or rank would have been or anything like that but I had enough 
enough rank to you know have free access to come land and you know visit this facility and leave like like there was it was almost like i had kind of i could do what i wanted type of feeling like there was no one over me um but i don't know it, you know it's all very right so you were like uh there to negotiate and you had the power to to negotiate on on behalf of some some uh body exactly exactly and it was yeah i just remember we were attempting to make a peace treaty and it wasn't just with the reptilians it was other other races and species beings too it was something very much that was like it was actively happening and i just remember the feeling that it was just like there was so much happening that we just it's you'd think that we should or we just want to stop all of it but for some reason some of it was allowed to happen like a lot of it was being allowed that was the feeling like we could, i could i was watching the manipulation and how they were controlling the planet and all i could do is like monitor it and take notes essentially it's and the only thing we could do is actually make uh, make try to make a peace treaty through negotiations I guess, unless you wanted like to wage an all out war, which I don't think would be ideal. And maybe that's still happening today. Like maybe that's, maybe that's the situation. Like for some reason or another, we can't interfere, you know, who knows what kind of, you know, protocols and treaties are in place that, that keep people from doing certain things. Right. So Tony, do you, you did spend some time on Mars that you've documented pretty well in other interviews. And obviously you have your, your two books that you talk about other places like series. And uh, actually I have, I have series Colony Cavalier right here and Project Star Maker. So for people who are listening and listening to Tony and others, other guests here today, talking about this this craziness this madness um tony is a, a an author who has sold a lot of books uh to people who want to know what's really happening behind the scenes because nasa is not telling us anything nasa's official site tells us that the only life that has been found in the universe is on earth even bacterial life and but they're looking we're looking that's a quote from nasa thanks nasa because um we have people who are giving us the real information outside of academia. Academia depends on NASA for its information. So if you go to the university, you're going to find out that the professors are going to say, yeah, the only life that exists in the universe is right here on Earth. So far, that's the best we got. And that's their official position. Well, we have other people whose corroborating testimonials create this really strong net. And Tony and Tony and I have talked about this before. These corroborating testimonials from the SSP insiders and, and um, Tyler's and Aaron's uh, podcast has brought forward so many of these testimonials are giving us a much broader and more interesting view of the universe um, where we understand finally that we're part of a galactic family and that we are not the first advanced race. We are the last and we're not that advanced. We're just coming into an, an understanding of what's possible. Tony, what, what uh, after that long speech, uh, I, I was trying to ask you a question and I just went off. These beings that you met, um, you said one of them was, you had a, you felt like there was an acquaintanceship, possibly even a friendship with. Uh, this being, as I remember, saved your life. Is that correct? I described it in the book quite a bit that, during the time I was in a, basically a military base, like an underground forward base with soldiers, with, you know, military personnel. And it was uh, abrasive. So the other soldiers and the people on the base, it was like, it was very abrasive. I didn't really, it wasn't a social play thing. It was a military atmosphere. So when I was in the field, you know, on the surface and in a combat situation, and a insectoid that was very smart, that was a, an intelligent being, interacted with me mentally. It treated me with a, with dignity, even though I was an enemy combatant. And it said, I, I begged it for my life, please don't kill me. And um, he said, I don't want to kill you. But if he, he gave me the dignity of being honest with me. I don't want to kill you, but if I'm told to, I will. Let's have a look kind of thing. That's how, that's exactly how he was. And uh it was like I got treated with respect for a minute. So that's why I say there was an acquaintanceship that um, this other being that was completely alien to me that thought a different way, behaved a different way, 
and in fact wounded me and was there to kill me gave me the benefit of the doubt and gave me an investigation you know like in, in a, there was an interaction and i cover that i cover that in the book and kind of that whole the whole scene of how that played out was you know relevant to what was going on in my life at the time you know with the lifestyle of being in a forward base there a military base so um there was a i just appreciated it uh, you know i just appreciated that a that it let me live albeit very badly wounded and b that it had gave me the dignity of being honest to me in that situation in a life and death situation i i i don't really have a metaphor to explain it like i don't have anything else that i can draw a similarity so that it makes it sound better you know i usually do um i do want to say this to what you said it's funny that science i remember being a little kid and saying look at all the stars in the sky there has to be life out there to one of my teacher like a professor that was a guest and he said well we don't have any proof that there's planets around the stars so until then we can't speculate that there's any life around the stars and i said well we do though because we have one star and we have all of our planets already and in this one star the one place that we've looked there's life there's intelligent life so it's a hundred percent so we instead of assuming that there's no life out of there Shouldn't we mathematically assume that there's life on 100% of the stars until proven otherwise? Like, doesn't that make more sense? So the one pe the one example we have is teeming with life on Earth and a planet that's, and excuse me, a star that is teeming with bodies or hard bodies around it. Uh, what What is it? 228 bodies around the, around the sun that we are aware of. 228 rocks. And so shouldn't we assume that there's that many around every star and that they're all populated because that's our one example. You know, you don't assume, you don't assume that um, a career criminal because you caught them in one crime, you know, you, they don't assume that somebody caught speeding only sped once. They assume that they always speed. They say you're speeding seven times and that's what the reflects the price of the fine. So you right. don't assume that they just did it. It's a one-off. So, our planet, our solar system is, is teeming with life and teeming with planets. Why would we assume that there's no life elsewhere? It's just, it's obviously misleading. Right. But, you know, I mean, that's an important thing that you touched on. So I, um, I hope that covered that question. Two parts. You're so, always thorough. I actually do have a memory from Mars. It's that I've, that has came through twice during via dream state, but it's the type of recall. That's like, that wasn't a dream. And it doesn't corroborate with anybody's testimony anywhere. And it sounds absolutely ridiculous, but I'll just share it just because why not? I've seen on two separate occasions, a, an amusement park on Mars. And it was, I remember very vividly like standing there and there was a, a rock archway that was natural that had like windows, like artificial windows carved out of it. And that was like the entrance to the park. And it was a, it was an amusement park as if like with roller coasters and stuff that we don't like actually have here in, in our amusement parks, but as if the slaves, the slave colonies were given a place to go and play. That's kind of the, the feeling that I got. And the one was so real. I remember it, my head, my woke up and my whole body like had a reaction, like, Oh my God, there's a, there's an amusement park on Mars. And then uh, on a separate occasion, I, had the same thing where I, I I was looking at a roller coaster. Now, who knows? Maybe it's just a dream, but all I know is that's it came through very prominently twice and it doesn't align with anything I've heard anybody else say. So take it with a grain of salt, but why not? I'll just share it. Well, we have these uh, sporting arenas on Earth that uh, capture the attention of millions or billions of people um, throughout the year, every year, every year. And all these games that are being played to keep us distracted from ourselves. Um, so the slaves are being distracted by games here on Earth. So yeah, why not on Mars too with an amusement park uh, to, to make you feel like you're free, to make you feel like you're happy. What, 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 a, what, a, what a cynical way of setting up a, a society uh, when you're in control of beings who you regard as slaves it's 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 i i don't even have the words uh, to talk about it because i guess 
I guess I was born into, um, I mean, I was, I've always been a being that um, detested force of any kind, forcing someone else to do something. I never understood it. And the bullies at school, I never understood them. Later, I understood that they were bullies because their parents had been bullying them, which is another sad fact to come up, come upon. And their parents themselves had been bullied by their bosses and the bosses had been bullied by the corporation and the corporation had been set up by nefarious forces. Um, so it all makes sense. It's just that we, we, we want to have a different life than to be slaves in this weird thought control matrix. But it sounds like Mars was, uh, at least in your um, QHHT session, quantum healing hypnosis technique session, Tyler, sounds like you you saw a vision of um, a world where they had set up this playground for slaves. Well, no, the, so the, the, the theme park memory is not from the session. That's just from dream state. Okay. Um, yeah, that's totally separate. That That's something that came through on you know independently i see i see well i i really appreciate your um sharing the qhht info too because i know that you had been um uh you were cautioning yourself about sharing qhht stuff because you were worried that sharing them publicly might might not be a good idea but i i feel like maybe you felt that now's the time to begin to share some of this intel from these sessions yeah, as long as I preface it with that, like, I'm not going to go around as some whistleblower, like, oh, there's this and that on Mars, and I've been there, because honestly, like, I just booked a session with somebody and sat there, and this stuff came through, and that's the reality of the situation. I have zero proof that any of it's real, besides my own feeling, and it felt very real, but I, I'm not going to spread that as true information. Right. Um, and for one, just to save from muddy in the waters and 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 confusing people if it's not true you know it might have been information that only pertained to me and and I, sh I have no right sharing it publicly you know so i hold on to a lot of the stuff that comes through my sessions but i feel okay sharing it now i don't i don't see the harm in it if it's in a setting like this and uh, you know you're make you're providing a safe place for us to do so that's what's important right 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 thank you for doing that so Lily, what are you thinking? Are you, do you have anything coming through uh, as you're listening to all of these things from Tony and Tyler and. Yeah. So something was just coming through a minute ago. Um, like I said, I like kind of briefly tuned in before this to try and to make contact with uh, Genova, the, the male version of me that has contacted me a few times. Yeah. And uh, near the end of it, as I was seeing like the, you know, the silver city and then the, the um, sensing that it was from the future. And uh, right before I kind of stopped tuning in to get ready to come on here, I was sensing um, like a mantid like being a very, very intelligent, advanced um, insectoid being. And whenever you were talking just a minute ago, I was getting a little bit more information from that being. I was feeling that being's presence again. And the word that was coming through was uh, like harmony in that this version of me um, looked human, didn't look like an ET or anything, uh, looked very human. You know, so this is in, in, in the future. And the message I was getting was that this is in, in the future you know, where we raise our frequency, this was in another dimension, is in another, the city is in another dimension, a higher dimension on Mars. And uh, it felt like, um, like a symbiotic relationship with these insectoids. And it's more of like a peaceful, harmonious thing. So I just wanted to share that because that kind of gives me hope because I know there's a lot of messed up things that are going on on Mars right now, but in the future, it seems uh, more bright. <laughs> So that's what, but I'm interested to talk more with that insectoid. I'm even feeling their presence right now. So, um, yeah, I'm interested to kind of dig into that further, but that's what was just coming through a minute ago whenever you were talking. Yeah. Hold on to that. Uh, Tyler looks like he wants to say something. Well, actually I just had a question for Jessica, you know, Jock was asking you about your memories, but I mean, you're a remote viewer. Have you remote mm -hmm. viewed anything on Mars and gotten any data? from any of your targets i don't think i've ever remote viewed mars before but speaking of insectoids so this is weird right so i i'm sorry my dog shouldn't have my dog in here i'm so sorry um so i i actually have had contacts where i have actually 
had an insectoid ET about three feet from me. Okay. At one point. And I've always wondered if there was a connection to life on another planet with me in this insectoid. It had a robe on and like a hood. It looked like the Grim Reaper actually, but it was definitely an insectoid. And I wonder now, like, as I'm listening to you guys talk about this, I have to wonder, did that insectoid have a connection to Mars? I don't know. Hmm. Um, but that's something that I've, I've experienced in the 3D, like in this life. Right. Solid. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I have to interject one more time, Jack. Tony smiled when I mentioned remote viewing. So have you have you done any targets on Mars, Tony, in your group? Uh, we have. We have done a couple targets on Mars. Um, we did the forward base, which came out, which checked out. It's unconfirmable. So it's one thing to remote view um, your local um school and so people can remote view it you can go there and see what they got and get an idea of how accurate they are it's another thing to remote view another planet where you can't confirm what they're seeing so the way that we score that in a group is the more the merrier so it's one thing to have three people remote view it but a dozen people and you start to see the common themes you start to see things you know if they all see a statue outside on a red you know red desert with a statue and 12 you know, 10 out of 12 people see a statue in a red desert. So you have to call that uh, some sort, you have to consider that some sort of confirmation. And from what I remembered from the forward base, we, we did, we did get a lot of details, right? They did get a lot of details, right? From it. So um, nothing forward? going on there, personnel, business personnel, and nothing really going on. They remote viewed a, uh, what else did we do? We did another, we tried to find the insectoid one. And it was all over the place. It was really, nobody got the same details right in that. And I think there was only six viewers. Um, but I just think that um, when you said that, when you said that question, like it's fun to think about, like, I think remote viewing is kind of exploding. It's like, everybody's getting into it these days and rightly so, because it's a very powerful skill. And so, um, you know, I'm working on it too. Like, uh, you know, I have a remote viewing group and it's, it's really, it's really an amazing uh, ability that everybody has. So yeah. I, and now, and the more I think about it, I think um, not to, not to front load anybody's anybody watching that might be in the group, but I think I'm going to whip up a couple more Mars targets after the show. So. So what's the forward base that you're referring to? So when I, when I was there, they gave us the, they gave us the Royal treatment. We landed from a larger craft into a hangar bay. When I got off the craft, they put bags over our heads and put us on a smaller craft and flew us for an hour to a smaller underground base that was a, a small base from the city. There was a city. So, you know, Randy Kramer, who I have a great deal of respect for, um, said that he estimated 10 and a half million people on Mars right now. Um, the city that I was in back in uh, might've been 88, you know um was very big it was a very big place it was very populated it was it wasn't it wasn't uh empty the forward base was small it was the like size of a like an elementary school underground five levels and you know it was it had been overrun by the insectoids and so everybody was evacuated and they just had the military maybe 50 people there and so it was a forward base in a different area um, okay so if that answers your question yeah, well, I think that as far as the harmony between races on Mars goes, um, it seems like we might be the problem because we go in and we start fights with uh, the ant people and we'll go try to steal one of their uh, artifacts or their precious artifacts um, that they have said, you, you know, you can't go here. This is our territory. And we'll just go in anyway because we because we have that um, that desire to uh at all costs, just get what we want. So I think that, you know, you know the, the dark faction of the sp secret space program, and I, I guess there are more than one dark faction, I'm not really sure, Tony would know more about this, but um, this dark faction will will just um, interrupt the lives of on Mars of these insectoid races. And, um, and then you have the reptilian races who, too, who have bases inside Mars. The Draco and other reptilian uh, species. So we, so there, there comes to be conflict. Um, but I think the insectoids themselves might might have been living in harmony without us coming there. Rebecca Rose talked about a native reptilian race on Mars. I think that she encountered. It actually, um, I think it might. They might have even saved her from the insectoids. 
and as a whole fascinating story but yeah i think there's definitely reptilians there as well uh one of the first ssp memories that i got just recently it was just a a second a few seconds but it was um i believe i was um a soldier and i was in some sort of like a transport going to mars or on mars already and i was in kind of like an elevator type deal with three very, very large reptilian beings. So that was kind of like my first glimpse mm. of that. So yeah, definitely reptilians. <laughs> and did you, do you, do you still feel the insectoid uh, presence uh, listening in right now? Um, a, a little bit, a little bit. I think it's kind of like hanging around. Right. It's, it's bizarre to be talking about these things for me because, as I said, uh, my my learning curve is really steep. And um, in the last seven or so years, um, the first time I even began to believe in ET races was when I went to the Bosnian pyramids in 2011. And I began to talk uh, just for three months there um, as a volunteer with out-of-the-box people who were telling me about ET races. And I was like, oh, wow, that's amazing. Because as a, a kid or in college, I had a couple of friends who had seen UFOs and they gave really detailed descriptions of their experiences. One said, uh, my ex-girlfriend said that she had seen three green triangles fly in formation from one horizon to the other in just a few seconds, like three seconds. And I thought, oh, that's weird. Doesn't sound like anything we built. Um, but I didn't know what to do with that information. You know, I'm just like a guy who didn't believe in ETs. So I was like, well, I'll, I believe you, but I don't know what to do with that. And then another friend said that he saw this big spaceship hovering over our college campus in SUNY Purchase uh, in upstate New York. And uh, he went back, he ran back, got his girlfriend, because she, she had told him, if you ever see an ET, come get me. So he's, he's like, she so he did. And they both watched the, along with a lot of other people, just stamp, standing on the twilight, looking up at this massive, huge, silent spaceship just floating along across the campus and then they went back to their uh their uh her art studio and were listening to the radio this is back before the days of what we have now with personal computers and they uh heard that the way the direction the direction the spaceship was going it was going over the hudson river parkway some cars had seen it and were calling into the radio station saying we where there's this spaceship of, above the Hudson River Parkway. So it was corroborated by not just the people on the highway, but other people on the on the campus who were standing there looking up at this thing like they were. And I was like, okay, I totally believe you. You're my friend. You're my best friend in college. And I didn't know what to do with it. Like, what am I going to do with that? And so it was many, many years later. It was probably, uh, I don't know, uh, 20, 25 years later that I went to the Bosnian pyramid complex and uh, started to get real downloads and to, to begin to understand what that there's much more going on than just we're what we're being told in school and by the news. So all so all of this is, is new to me. All this is real new. And I'm just I just wanted to get you guys together because y'all have been doing this for a long time. And uh, many of you are experiencers and contactees, and uh, you have intuitive gifts that are are really extraordinary. And um, so, what what do you guys think, uh, Abby? Do you have any? Um, do you feel like chiming in with anything right now? I see you sitting there and smiling. No, um, I just wanted to mention with the the mantid beings, I. I have experiences with them and they've always been extremely very loving and very supportive, um, beautiful heart space from them. And I, you know, I can hear them, you know, it's like the little clucks and, you know, it's like we need, they come in around, um, and, uh, natural engineers. And you we were just talking like I got Stargate. So I don't know if they've built some of the Stargates that we see today. I don't know if they've been part of that engineering with them. Um, you know, uh, when my, when my son was younger, he, uh, one of his guides was a, a mantid and I actually bought him a, um, astrophysics book cause he's very mathematical. And, um, I said, Hey, just, you know, go through this book with your guide and see what they have to say. And already like on the second page, he heard his mantid guide come in and he was correcting some of the math in it. So, wow. 
Um, but at any rate, um, it's always been extremely positive. And one of my memories, and this was not in a session, this was a very strong memory. Um, I've never really shared this except with some, some of my friends. Um, but on there was, uh, I don't want to call it a mission, but we kind of were, but there were all these insectoids, mantid be, and I feel like there was a mixture of of in, of insectoids, but most of them were mantids, and for some reason they're they're negative. These these ones I felt negative, and we'd essentially wiped out. I just felt like everyone was gone. We wiped everything out, and there was this little this small little mantid, like, and I knew he was master. The little boy was just left as an orphan, and um, I took him in. I took him in, and his my essentially my surrogate son and um so every so i still feel him and he'll come in and he'll pop into my third eye and just check in on me and mm -hmm. so anyway so i have a lot of i have a lot of very uh clear memories of that and being with him and he's you know he's an engineer but very loving so and what size yeah. was he uh well granted this is you know from when i saw him he was very tiny. I mean, maybe the size of a six, seven year old when he was little, when he was very little. Um, I mean, now he's much larger, but he's still, he is still, if we were to put him into age range of, of our species, he would be about a 16, 17 year old boy, but I know he's close to 200 years old. So. Wow. Yeah. Well, I've had uh, praying mantises on my property since I was a kid. Uh, we used to live in Pennsylvania, and my brother and I bought these um, praying mantis eggs online. And uh, not online. Well, there was no online when I was a kid. We bought them through the mail. <laughs> and uh, back in the old days. And uh, they came in covered wagons. And uh, anyway, so we had these beautiful, we would watch them hatch. And we would feed them and we'd find some bugs around and feed the praying mantises. It was like the coolest thing for kids to do. And then when I came out to Texas to be with my mom been here for six years, I did the same thing. I bought some praying mantis eggs and um, we have them all around the property. And they're just, you know, once in a while, I'll see an adult one just hanging out in a mulberry tree or something. And just they're, they're loving it here. So I have a real affinity for praying mantises. I have a fear of ants, though. And I'm kind of wondering if there's something in, in a past life on Mars if I did have one there, where there was some problem with between me and ants, because I have a real fear of them. It's visceral. Uh, spiders too, but I think the giant spiders on Mars are feared by pretty much everyone, not just me. So, Right. David Bowie knew all about those spiders. David Bowie. Oh my goodness. Beautiful starseed. Holy cow. Holy cow. His aura, his field is incredible. Who who was it last night, Lily? That was just saying like he's some prince on Mars or something. Like he has like uh, David Bowie's like a whole life. To, I forgot who was telling the story. Yeah, I don't uh, remember who it was, but I, I remember what you're talking about. Yeah, somebody's yeah. talking about that. <laughs> I, I mean, I would not be surprised at all. Maybe that's why he even wrote about it. Um, Do you think that David Bowie and other people, maybe Carl Sagan and other people who presumably were said to have died here? actually didn't die but were given new lives on mars or other planets any of you guys i would say it's highly highly likely for a number of people but there's no way to confirm it obviously yeah i, I have a feeling that carl sagan because he suddenly got cancer and lost his hair and i and I, it never seemed right to me uh i i felt that that was just a um a ruse and that because he'd done such good work for us some good faction of the SSP told him, you know, we're going to give you another life on another planet. And I don't know what planet that is or a moon or something. And maybe it was Mars. Who knows? Uh, I mean, the, the Martian atmosphere right now is is breathable. We're told by academia, I believe, that that there's not uh, an atmosphere that can be breathed there. But so many uh, SSP insiders have said that they you can breathe there. It's just that if you start running around, you're going to have trouble. There's not that much oxygen. Uh, Tony, do you have some experience with the, the atmosphere? Yeah. So it's uh, it's much thinner. So Mar the Mars, the Martian atmosphere is about one percent of what the Earth's atmosphere is. Um, and it sounds like not much, but really, when you consider the planet is half the size, a sphere half the size. The atmosphere is actually taller than the atmosphere on Earth, so it's it's like 120 miles 
whereas the earth is 100 and 101 or 105 miles up so there's quite a bit of atmosphere on mars and it's one of the things um i'm trying to think what i did i did a a call like this like a zoom call i think it was michigan mufon and a lot of the people were beating me up over the over the atmosphere there's no way you can breathe on mars buddy and so you know you're full of it you're full of it and I did the math on it. I, re uh, you know, I recently said there's only one percent of the atmosphere, and it turns out one percent of the Earth's atmosphere is quite a bit of air. It's quite a bit. And then we're starting to get NASA. We're starting to hear. I think uh, there was a there was a um, Instagram reel came out that um, they're actually finding a lot more complex uh, chemical makeup in the atmosphere than they've recently told us. Than the Viking lander told us. You know, so the so. NASA and the space agencies that are sending probes to Mars are backpedaling on what the atmosphere is made up of. So currently. And, and there's trees, like there's the photographs depict trees and it's 70 work. degrees. Yeah. It's 70 degrees around the equator of Mars. It All gets right. in the seventies. So, so you can t-shirt, uh, you right. can t-shirt there. So. And then the new, the new Mars Rover photos are allegedly from Greenland. And I did that dig and that's true. Like, if you go to Google Earth in Greenland, somebody put the coordinates on TikTok. There's a whole Mars, a whole NASA Mars reenactment. They say that that's where the astronauts are training, but they have the rover, they have everything. And like the the photographs you take, you can screenshot the Google Earth um, Greenland. And it is, if you just put a red tint on it, you're looking at Mars. Mm -hmm. I mean, so I think we're, I think some of the, some of the photos we're being shown are literally Greenland. And it's not, I mean, it's no joke. There's like a NASA van and like the fake astronauts and you can see the rover. It's all in Greenland. So uh, not the fake astronauts, but um, the uh, the rover and, the, and there's people like behind the set kind of. So it's interesting why they feel the need, maybe because they know they can't show us what's actually happening on Mars anymore. Um, because it, it would be teeming with life and there's things that we just they, they never want us to know about so in order to make it to keep the dog and pony show going they're like okay just you know nobody knows what the hell's going on in greenland anyway let's just show them some footage from there and oh but look this this is the new if, mars footage if there's a live feed of something unpredicted happen that would prove that there's life there they can cut to the fake feed quickly the same as like same like the moon missions they right. did go to the moon. They did have a fake moon land. They did have the, they have it faked and they were there in reality in case an ET walked up, they could cut to the fake reel. And right. it's the same with the rover missions and anything else. So uh, that's, that makes more sense to me than any of the other, right. you know, plausible, what there's, what theories that. Why would they take the risk? Dare I say it. Right. Why would they take the risk of live streaming from a, uh, covert a mission right another planet whatever they're doing if they don't know what could possibly be what could show up like that, that could be detrimental to their narrative so they would never take that risk that's yeah. right having a 20-foot centipede walk by right. and uh on live on on live feed to everybody on the internet so yeah they'd have a hard time cutting that out well if somebody saw it now everyone would be like oh deep fake it's, it's ai cgi you can't believe shit anymore unfortunately that you see i yeah, mean it's, it's a big ever, problem i ever wondered why why out of all the you know the planets out there why did they choose to seed our consciousness with with mars i mean it's been part of the narrative you know the Mars, you know martians why did they choose to make that as part of our narrative maybe they didn't choose to maybe it was inevitable that we would tap into that so they're like okay well let's just get control of it you know right well i i've been researching for an article on the the giant ants on mars the ant people and it turns out that the only books the only sci-fi books that have been being written about giant ants on, on, on in our solar system or are giant ants on mars so it's like either the authors are tapping into the truth that there are giant ants living inside mars or somehow they were influenced by uh people who wanted to as tyler said take control of the narrative in advance so that if any one of us ever started talking about giant ants inside mars just as we are today people would say just as they do in tony's youtube comments oh that's just sci-fi that's still those are sci-fi books these people are crazy so right. you know, 
you saw Starship Troopers, which, by the way, everybody should watch. I do yeah. think that there's tons of disclosure in that. Yeah. That I mean, yeah, that that is why they do it because then they can dismiss it. Right. That's why right. They show it that. Yeah. Well, I mean, you think back. Is it was it the Flintstones with the the green Martian he had antenna? I mean, they always showed him with his little antenna, like a little, right. insect, little bug. Something From the future. From the future. Yeah. Yep. And the and the Jetsons, we still haven't even gotten close to that. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> that was a false promise. Yeah. I want to live in the Jetsons world. It looked a lot of like a lot of fun to me. Right. I I want to touch on something Abby said was why why did they go why Mars? Like why is there consciousness there? I think that some on a technical issue, I think it's easier to create heavier gravity artificially than it is to lighten gravity artificially. So if you're a species that's grown up on a smaller planet, it's a lot of work to go to a big a planet the size of Earth and deal with the gravity, to put anti-gravity gymnasiums, every, for instance. But to move to a planet that's smaller, that has less gravity, it's easier to, to thrive there. So it has an appeal. It's half the size of Earth. So what I'm saying is it's easier to move somewhere where there's less gravity than it is to move somewhere that there's more gravity. And so the Earth is suited for, we don't realize that, you know, a, a lot of most planets in the universe are probably smaller than Earth or or bigger. Like we're it's just it's, we're in a sweet not in a standard sweet spot of size. Like that's an issue. So you have to have technology that that alters the gravity or you have to deal with it. And in the space program in series colony, when we were on when we went to planets that were like one point one G or one point two, it was a technical problem. It was a big problem. Just a little bit of more gravity is still a big issue as far as flying the ship around, moving cargo, load, offloading, loading. You only got so much time before people get exhausted. Like gravity is a big deal um, to overcome. So, you know, if you're a species that comes into our solar system, set up shop because of whatever reason, and your you're a home planet is more like the size of Mars, it makes a lot of sense. It's got atmosphere and it's that size. So I think that... Um, you know, unfortunately, we don't have any bigger ones. We'd have a lot of short, short, yeah. stubby ETs weren't walking around if we had a bigger planet nearby. So, so, um, and to add to that, so the, and when we're looking at the Egyptian hieroglyphs, um, a lot of people are wondering, like, what are those little bags that they're covered, that they're carrying around? And, um, and people have noticed that some of their, they all have these devices on their wrists, or these wrists, and yeah, they're like yeah. holding a bag. So um, I think I mentioned this at the last conference, but um, it literally, it, it came through for me again. I was like folding laundry and this was just like in the background and uh, they came through and they said, well, it's a device that um, helps control their blood in their body because the gravity was so different here and that it's actually, it's a gravitational so that the blood flow remains for where they're from versus being affected by our gravity. And that's what that was. And so mm -hmm. I'm assuming that that bag might be some type of a, a device that makes this continue to work that's that's interesting you know we're it talking makes a about, lot of sense we're talking about mars but like i think there's a very similar situation occurring on venus as well and there's a lot of people who have talked about life on venus and tesla being from venus and the whole elon musk from venus theory and uh there's just a number of of testimonies and stuff and there's even maps like if, if you go on, i forgot what the website is like it's an archive of maps and of earth the the t terrain the topographical maps but you can look at mars and venus and it's completely detailed of venus it has all the mountains and canyons and stuff it's like how in the world is this mapped out and it's right here in the internet and and they allegedly this was done from like the early satellites but it's way too detailed and way too detailed and i think that I think it's just like kind of their way of like slipping it out there in the internet. Like it's not just like a, a an unknown object. We know this place is mapped out. We know every canyon, crevice, mountain, valley, whatever. And they just leave out the buildings and whatever. And I've heard from a few different people that the Dune movie is disclosure of Venus. Like that is what it looks like on Venus. That basically they just changed the planet name to Venus. And that's kind of the scenario, if that's true. Well, Vanessa Lyle has talked about this because I asked her about Nikola Tesla. I said, um, how's he doing? Is he available to talk to? And and she said 
she checked in with her guides and she said, uh, he's back on Venus. He's really happy. He's working with his family and with colleagues to figure out ways to get good technology to us, to humanity, to help us, just as he was doing here in his life here, where, where he didn't know he was from Venus, but he was brought here as a baby and left to be found by people who were directed to find him and they raised him as their own. So um, she says that Venus is um, much like Earth. Um, so that conflicts with what you're saying, Tyler, but, but whatever the case, um, it seems that the testimonials are that Venus is inhabited. Um, and so uh, I expect it to be uh, a beautiful place to, to go. We're being told that by ac academia that it cannot be inhabited, that it's got poisonous gases in its atmosphere. Um, but then why wouldn't they lie about Venus the way they've lied about Mars? You know, the, it, it, our lives are full of uh, endless layers of deception. Um, so, so we're hoping to get some some real intel out there with this with this uh, podcast or the real action is taking place on venus and they have us looking at mars as a distraction well actually tyler okay so earlier you had asked if i had ever remote viewed mars and i said i didn't think so well i, I get a lot of targets where i don't know what the target is i'm, I'm never even told right but i just remembered as we're talking about venus that our Kim Ra, our friend uh, he had been part of Project Phoenix, the secret space programs. He gave me some blind targets a while back. And one of them was a jump gate to Mars. And the other was a jump gate to Venus. And I did confirm with that those blind targets, there are jump gates to Mars and Venus, I do believe, through that data. And, uh, and from what I could tell, it seemed to be very Earth-like on both of those places. So I can't believe I forgot about that. That wasn't that long ago. Uh, I, we did a show on that together, actually, back in December. So you guys are welcome to go check that out. So right. I have remote viewed it. And, and the, go, ahead. go ahead. No, go ahead, Zach. Well, I was just going to ask, uh, was that a remote viewing, do you know, uh, in the present time? Yes, in the present time. Uh, this was actually, th these targets were based off of some testimony, I believe Andrew Basiago had given. Uh, I'm pretty sure uh, there was, they were saying there were jump rooms in, I think it was an MLS stadium in like a, a soccer stadium in California, I believe. And um, the CIA three letter agency was using this and, uh, and he, he claimed to have been part of a program with Obama, I believe, and, and saw, uh, had been using jump games. And you saw vegetation on Mars that was Earth-like vegetation? You know, I remember I remember in the targets, it did seem as though it was very earth like, like what where we live, like a forest okay, on those places. So it was more of a city from what I could remember. I'll have to go back and look at my data because I don't have my data right here. Um, well, I was going to give you I was I was thinking about giving you a, um, a target on Mars before this uh, interview. And I thought, wait, I don't even know what I'm doing. If I give her a target on Mars. She's already going to be front loaded with the knowledge that it's on Mars. So how would I even give her a target? I I didn't I didn't know enough to figure out how to do that. And I was like, ah, just yeah, slip that, in her mailbox. About that. <laughs> slip in her mailbox. I'll tell her this. So um, yeah. <laughs> what I what I think is also interesting to note is if we let's take Earth as an example, if we crash landed on Earth from another planet or landed here, you can and then you own explored a very small percentage of your local area and you would go back and share that memory or that information earth is a desert planet because you landed in the sahara desert earth is a is a veg a jungle planet because you landed in the amazon it just depends like who knows like it, it could be all of the above it's not just like it's the same terrain the same environment the same ecosystem all the way around the planet so everyone's Everyone could be right. It could be very much like Dune. It could be very much like Earth. It could be very vegetated, just depending on what part of the planet that you're remembering. Right. I just imagine it as this incredibly honeycombed place where much of the activity is going on below the surface. Do you guys have any um, corroboration on that? I think that's yes. I think that's accurate. Yeah, go ahead, Tony. 
I was going to say we never went to Venus. The Ceres Colony Corporation was um, not as advanced as whoever is in Venus. That was what, when we talked about moving cargo, we really never went to any of the inner planets, Mercury either. Um, but we were aware that the whatever whoever was in charge of Venus was hostile towards the Ceres Colony Corporation and way more advanced. So we never went. We never went to Venus. We never. We snuck into Saturn sometimes um, to Enceladus to look for sightseeing. We weren't allowed around Saturn either. Uh, so there's the so definitely in the space programs, there are diplomatic lines drawn. So you know not everybody goes to all the planets. Uh, Ganymede is like uh, the United Nations area where everybody goes there and negotiates. It's all around Jupiter basically. There's quite a bit around Jupiter and then actually in distant orbit of Jupiter. So far out from Jupiter, it's its own, it's its own solar system. But um, Venus, we were aware that there was a very highly advanced, very ancient tech, um, society there. They were, they were old. So that's the only briefing that I got on it. What about the, um, the interior life of uh, Mars? Did you, did you feel when you were there that it was, that life was mostly below the surface? Absolutely. Yes. The insects as well. And, um, the city when I was, when I, so when my program got canceled, like I said, the place, the base that I was in looked like a modern school. Like it was concrete. It had carpet, bright, bright colors, um, carpet everywhere with kind of like, you know, with ramps that you walked out, it was comfortable, very wide hallways. Uh, it looked like a, a modern day elementary school that kids are in nowadays is kind of what it looked like. When we moved, when my program got canceled and I was put into the city to be reassessed and trained for a new job, it was a modern city, but it was underground, like, there, you know, without the sky, like the same way when you walk through a shopping mall with vast ceilings and modern art and it had really flowing lines. It wasn't, it wasn't brutal architecture. It was very, it was very pleasing. The, and the first place I got next to the hangar was a dome underground and it was a clear you could see through it but the only thing you could see was dirt on the other side of the of the wall it was covered in dirt but it was a geodesic dome and a few of them connected that were underground which actually makes the most sense if you think about it um building something like that like it was an early and that was the hangar area and there were palm trees there were uh, water fountains it was you know it was a like i said the the best thing I have to say to quote, you know, to describe it is like a shopping mall, like a really nice shopping mall. You know how there's in its landscape. It was exactly like that. And that, and it went on and on. And it, when you went to other parts of it, it was laid out more like a hotel. When you, when you're in a Hilton or somewhere that has hallways, strong, long hallways and rooms on each side, it was a lot of it was like that. Like, like that's where I stayed. I had, I had my own room and um, I, it was, it was by my standards in the space program during my time, it was, it was luxurious. Well, the wind storms on Mars are probably one of the reasons, maybe the only reason that they don't build on the surface in general. They're underground. Do you think that's the case, Tony? No. Well, so there's a bit of, you know, there's a bit of safety. In, in the, so here on Earth, we have, a, you know, a huge society and there's a treat, treaties between the ETs. We have the moon. What I'm saying is another spacefaring civilization isn't going to fly here and fly up to the earth unannounced to the right to the advanced ets that are in the neighborhood there's the moon is here so they have a huge battle station or whatever it is space station to you know and a treaty around the earth so ets do have to hide somewhat hide their presence here that's not the case in mars there's not a treaty they can just fly right up and do whatever they want around Ceres colony too so staying hidden under the surface is a safety measure as well so you don't know who's going to fly up and just openly take your stuff. And so that's the reality of, of the space. It's, um, there's a, it's a security measure also to stay underground. It's cutthroat, survival of the fittest. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So from my memories and my experiences, I mean, my God, we complain about our politics here and our treaties and our borders. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a nightmare um, up there. And there are councils and federations. I mean, and none of them trust each other, first off. I mean, and they, it's, 
it is a nightmare. It is a logistical, uh, it's a red tape governmental UN treaty nightmare every everywhere. And it right. is impossible to get any of them to work together. And that is part of the trust. Um, a lot of people are here experience, you know, they chose to come here to experience so that therefore they can go up and they're testifying to these different groups. And it's, and it's like testifying, 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 testifying with all of these groups, because, well, this one isn't going to trust the, the words that come out of that group, that testimony, they needed to hear it firsthand. And so these people who are trying to get things moved, um, it's taking forever. It's just taking forever up there too. So it's, that, al that aligns with the information in Sean David Morton's books, the Sands of Times. It, it talks very much about the galactic politics and nobody trusts each other. If that information is true, which I, I, I wholeheartedly believe it is, um, it is, it is very much like you say, there are so many different groups that have their hand in the game and everybody, no one trusts each other. No, no one trusts each other. And yeah. it's, it's, it's not like we imagine it here on earth like some you know, you know these beautiful space fairing you know, everyone's just getting along i i think that's mm. part of the misinformation to you know i just think it's misinformation I, i'm not saying that's not happening like i'm sure there are beautiful people you know in civilizations getting along but but um well don't stop here what did you what did you say politics i said politics don't stop on earth like it, I, it yeah well, the Sands of Mars is um, ostensibly science fiction. Is that correct? Sands of time. So what did I say? San, you said the Sands of Mars. Oh, <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So it's basically it's it's well it's science it's it's in the genre published as a science fiction book. But when you open it up and read the introduction, it tells you otherwise. It's uh, just you can't sell it as as fact. You know. Right. So, it's it's information that was handed to him whenever this man moved on from the shadow government. He spent 40 years in the shadow government, meticulously diaried everything he did, knowing that he was going to pass it along to Sean David Morton because he was friends with him. But he couldn't he couldn't share any of the information while he was alive due to NDAs. But when Sean got the diaries and some USB drives, allegedly with information, classified information, really. Sean had to sign NDAs also, and he had to change a lot of the major names and the damning information. So you're still getting the like, information, but the names of the people and maybe even some of the places are changed slightly to, wow. you know, for security reasons. But I, you can tell, like intuitively, you really got to read it and tap in. You can tell what's embellished, what Sean added, you know, where he exaggerated things, and then where he's relaying information from the journals. It's very apparent the dif the difference, and if you once you learn how to feel into that, it's a, they're amazing, amazing books with with t classified information that everybody should know if they want to have an intelligent conversation about disclosure, and uh, they're just absolutely incredible in my opinion. Well, we have um, looks like four more minutes left in the two hour session. It's already been almost two hours. Amazing. Um, so, what do you guys see? For the future of Mars, I mean, do you know, Lily? You you've talked about how things are looking pretty good in the in your future life in Mars, right? That's what it was looking like. Yeah, that's what it felt like. Good um, harmony with um, the insectoid uh, beings. I guess some of the natives, or um, yeah. And I wanted to add, Abby. I agree. The experiences that I've had with insectoids, I've I've kind of seen like a flash of some like negative oriented. I, I don't have any personal experiences with that that I remember, but um, I've had a lot of really wonderful experiences with uh, with the insectoids. They're some of them are pretty enlightened, very very advanced. But yeah, so that's 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 what I was getting. Yeah. Well, um, Tyler wrote in chat that we should reoccupy Mars, and I love this idea. And uh, I think I'm going to get a shirt that says "Reoccupy Mars." Sure. Thanks, Tyler. That, that is a shirt that I think Tony and Jackie made. Jackie oh, right. made it. Oh yeah, my Jack god! Yeah, yeah, I saw. Yeah, Jackie I seen a bunch of those. Yeah, but yeah. what? But why did you get that uh, idea? I mean, who had that idea, and why did you have that idea to reoccupy Mars? Jackie Kenner had came up with those shirts and um, made had those made. You know, back when it, because it's the um, Occupy Mars was the thing that, you know, SpaceX did. So she said, reoccupy Mars. It, you oh. know, it wasn't correct. 
or reoccupying them. Well, I've, I've been tweeting uh, Elon for a year and Tyler said it's, you know, he already knows about all this SSP stuff, but, but, you know, on the, on the off chance that he doesn't know, I keep tweeting him saying, you know, you're not going to be allowed to land on Mars. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's the interesting thing. I mean, you know, we have publicly that whole mission to Mars, everything, everything's going to the moon and Mars all of a sudden. And so I, I don't know what disclosure is going to look like, but I definitely think it's not going to be the stuff that we're talking about. They're going to, they're going to go on some trip. They just sent all that stuff to the moon, all those, all that, whatever the hell it was, art and, and whatever it was. You guys know what I'm talking about? No. Oh. Um, anyway, I'm not doing it any justice, but they just That's did okay. one trip. They just did one trip to the moon. They sent a bunch of objects up there and oh. stuff like for the first time it's ever been, they sent like, like some uh, art and XRP and crypto and like all kinds of weird stuff in like some capsule or something to the moon. And anyway, there's no doubt in my mind they're gonna eventually gonna have manned missions to the moon and set up some sort of space academy and it'll move into some sort of Star Trek future and it's gonna act like they're gonna act like it's all happening right now and this is the first time we've done all of it. Same with Mars. It's all gonna be and I don't I don't think they have any intention of ever telling us that there was always you know we bases on the moon and life on Mars. I think maybe one day we'll just collectively be in a place where we'll understand that, but I don't think they're going to come out and tell us. I think they're going to keep playing that show, keep playing that movie as if we are just now getting there and establishing bases for the first time and we have complete control over everything. Don't worry. Listen to us. You know, right. I think that's what they're going to try to do. Now, if that actually happens, I don't know, but that's definitely what they're trying to do in my opinion. Agreed. I totally agree. What do you think, Tony? I think exactly that. Uh, well, so there's a few versions of disclosure and it looks like they might all, there may be different elements of different ways to disclose happen all at once. So we go to the moon, we find the ruins and then all of a sudden sh spaceships show up or we go to the moon, go to Mars and they find ruins or discover life and then spaceships show up. And so I think we're going to get a rapid disclosure that's going to be uh, bombard the public with too much to keep up with. And so we'll just accept it. And it, and then uh, five days later or five weeks later, we're going to have gadgets and things that keep us occupied <laughs> that nobody cares about the history of it. You know, like they'll yeah. sort it out later, just like whenever something happens, how it magically goes away. You know, yeah. we've just seen it recently with that thing we can't talk about. So there's all these things they said was the reality and we all knew it wasn't. And then it just magically disappeared. And all the facts with it. And all the facts come out. They go, yeah, you, oops, you, we, you were right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Next. Oh, and look over here. Done. Disclosure is going to do the exact same thing. It's going to be the exact, we're going to say, no, we, you were always up there. And they go, yeah, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, you're right. But look at this. It right. closed. So <laughs> that's, I think that's what going to, that's what disclosure is going to be like. That's, it's going to happen so fast that nobody's going to care about yeah. the, the nature of it because it's going to be such a shock. And and they don't care that we find out about it because the damage is done. Like it's over. Like it's, it, yeah. it, it's been so long ago, like you said, and we're going to, they rely on us being distracted and they understand us better than we understand ourselves, at least the, the masses. Right. And they're going to wow you and enamor you with the fancy gadgets and technologies or whatever. They know what they're doing. And we'll get Mars. We'll get our cities up there that are going to be um, look like they're brand new and separate from, I mean, Right now, there are dumbs under all of us. So I know Tyler and you and Lily are near the St. Louis area. You know there are dumb bases around there, deep underground military bases. These are entire self-sufficient cities that are under the ground, under all of us. They're in Michigan. They're everywhere. There are hundreds of them worldwide. Nobody has any idea what's going on. You can see the funny building that's out in the middle of the field that has a you know an evergreen truck parked outside. This is going to be the same exact thing that we get after a disclosure on Mars. We're going to get our city and you're going to be giant cities that are underneath of it. That you have no idea. So it, the, everybody assumes that academia or the news is going to show you everything. And it's not the case. Like it's going to march right along. There's going to be a covert secret space program all along after a disclosure as well. So, and why, and why not? It's safety. It's, you know what I mean? It's like a safety a precaution for mankind. Right. So I hate to give anybody, I hate to give these guys a pass for being so um, immoral, 
you know, but there are things like um, we're going to get disclosure. It's a not if it's when, and we're going to get our vacation up there. Um, and it's just going to, it's going to be business as usual. Yeah. Well, I, I what if we want to, what if we want to build a house on Mars in, in 10 years, you think they're going to let us? I think that'd be dicey at best. Yeah. I think that's dicey. Um, I don't know, man. Uh, it might also be expensive. Well, yeah. I'm writing a sci-fi screenplay about a, a young woman who starts a business there. Um, she's a recruiting people for Mars. And she's trying to sell Mars as a wonderful place to be. So that's her advertising campaign. But uh, I have a feeling that this idea that Mars is a red forbidding planet is, is not quite right. That we've been told that the sky on Mars is red. But I've heard from SSP insiders that it's actually violet and it's purple and it's beautiful. Is that, do you, have you seen that, Tony? Yeah, the sun sets purple. It's true. It turns purple. It's a pale blue, like a really light blue, like much paler, like on a pale day. It's blue. The sky right. is blue. What like uh, and during the, the sky here, when the sun is out, like the sky here, but way paler, like a much less. Like that's a really bright blue. It's like it's okay. much dimmer blue than that, but it is. And later on, and then it depends if the wind, how the weather, the weather changes super fast on Mars. The weather changes immediately in a few minutes, and it can turn red. The sky can turn red, and at night, if it clears up, you'll see a purple haze. Wow. A light purple everywhere that the sky is. I saw it one on one occasion. Um, what else was I going to say about the sun? Well, anyhow. Well, we got oh, I was going to say that there was a heavy, a heavy planet we went to, and the sky was dark blue. Like, almost, it was a very dark blue, because it was a bigger planet. It was a heavy gravity world. Okay. Well, we got to figure out a way to get control of the winds on Mars so we can have nice little houses up there. Um, so any any last words? Uh, if you guys want to give links to where you can be found, uh, that'd be fine. Well, whatever you like to do, uh, just uh, whatever your intuition tells you. This, thank you. This was this was a lot of fun. Thank you. Oh, good, good. I'm glad. And, and uh, your your script, your screenplay, kind of almost sounds like something that. Uh, we saw in Total Recall, you know, you know, trying to sell Mars is like a great place, and then they get there, and it's not the case. Mm. Uh, well, I think that's what they told the all the the uh, two hundred thousand recruits from Terra when they said uh, we we want you to be. And you were actually approached for this, Tyler, by this guy Larry, who said it's going to be amazing. There's going to be women for for you, as many women as you want. And of course, women are always the best selling point um, for any planet because uh, women are amazing. And uh, mm -hmm. and as men, we love you. So, uh, yeah, hopefully when we go to Mars, there'll be all these women for us. But um, I'm guessing it's just going to be sand, um, giant ants, giant and sandworms. Tony, do you remember sandworms from being there? I didn't ride any giant worms, so sadly. OK, because I've heard testimonials that there are war uh, sandworms on Mars uh, in the sand, but they're not as big as pictured in the movies. So uh, any last words uh, from you, Lily? Um, I just want to say thank you for inviting me. This has been uh, this has been nice. And it's actually piqued my curiosity in Mars even more. Um, and I feel like now is a, a good time. A lot of people are just starting to tap into these memories and have these things starting to come up. So hopefully this helps people who are watching in the audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, there's been this incredible push uh, in the media to to paint Mars as this forbidding planet. And I really feel that there's probably a lot of wonderful things about it. Now, Jessica, you wore red in honor of Mars, I assume, today. Of course. I yes. was only thinking of that when I put this on today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, totally. uh, do you have any last words for, for, your, for the, the people of Terra, the people of Earth? Yes. I mean, this has been fantastic. I really enjoyed listening to everybody today and uh, and sharing my little tiny tidbit there. And uh, and I hope you guys will go and, and watch that show that I did with Arkeem Ra, uh, where I did remote view jump, jump gates to Mars and to Venus. Uh, and I think the reason that they keep us looking in other directions is because there is activity going on on both of those planets currently. 
And, uh, and I do believe they do have access through portals, but that's just my opinion. And that was in the data. So you guys go, please check that out. I'm sorry. I didn't even think to grab that data before the show today. This video is on Cryptid Huntress on YouTube. The Cryptid Huntress on YouTube and Rumble. That video is up on Rumble as well. So I'm on both. Uh, yeah. You can find me there and on my website, thecryptidhuntress.com. So thanks for having me. Absolutely. Now, Abby Lynn, you are, um, you are, holding the, uh, you're grounding us beautifully in the way you're sitting. And you're just like, you're like the queen of Mars sitting there going, yeah, I'm just listening. So tell us, tell us uh, as the queen of Mars, uh, tell us your thoughts uh, for, for the Terrans uh, out there. That's why she's next to that monolith right there. <laughs> I mean, seriously, this thing is, is beautiful. I love wow. it. Wow. That is gorgeous. Really yeah, it's uh, it's six pounds. Um, talking about grounding. Wow. Um, oh my God! So, Jock, thank you so much for holding space for this, and thank you for all you guys. It's been a long time since I've seen you and chatted with you guys. Um, I I love doing these type of roundtables because, again, it's you know it's it's memories coming through, and I always wonder and ask. I mean, I ask my higher self and my guides when these bleed throughs of memories come through. It's like why what is it about that memory that i was able to break through something to come like why is it that moment you know like lily's like it's just like a this room like it's like a drive-by memory um but it helps to to listen to others and maybe you can find pieces together um message for the terrans and i love that you use terrans too because that's you know what i use as well um first off this retrograde right now is kicking me in in the booty um, <laughs> I've been, um, I've been a little flatlined lately. This, the energy, I, 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 again, like, I just feel like, uh, like the energy is pushing up against something, uh, massive right now. And I'm really kind of ready for that, <sighs> that moment to come through. Um, so, but for the Terrans, just community, 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 um, finding joy, um, literally finding people that you love and spending as much time as you can in those joyful loving moments um create memories this planet is freaking beautiful so go explore it and spend time in there um you know people can go and enjoy the space all they want to i think while they're doing that and they've opened up mars and the moon for tourism i'm gonna go to like costa rica and like just chill out <laughs> <laughs> right um but uh that's pretty much it that's really just it just I don't know. I just feel like collectively, I just want to tell everybody, just, just hold each other, just hold each other right now. That's what I'm going to say. I do want to add while you, you mentioned community, while I have a chance to say this, I'd like to invite everybody to our conference in May in Grafton, Illinois. Tony's going to be there. Lily will be there. Abby, you're going to, you're going. I don't know if Jock's coming back, but you, you got a free pass to come. Jessica, you talked about coming. So it would be nice to see you guys all back there again. And, uh, it's uh, May 13th through the 16th, and tickets are still available at rebelsofdisclosure.com. It's going to be a lot of fun. If anybody feels compelled to join us, um, you can grab a ticket there and uh, hope to see you there. It's going to be a lot of fun. And it's a great place to experience community in ways that you don't get to every day. Yeah. Right. It's like this big, uh, it, the, the Perry Marquette Lodge is like this big sort of, uh, it's where you'd go on a ski vacation or a, uh, uh, not that there's any mountains around to ski, but you know what I'm saying? It's like this beautiful lodge where you can get together and these beautiful grounds where uh, you just feel at peace there. There's all these nice trees and it's not like a concrete parking lot. It's it's just a beautiful um, winding, little winding roads. And so you, you get a chance to feel the sense of community. And I think that's, uh, as Abby was saying, that's super, super important now. Um, we've been purposely isolated by dark forces for our whole lives. And so have our parents and their parents before them. And so we're, we're, our mandate is to come together. And so I was, re I'm really happy to have all of you here. Um, and uh, to talk about Mars, well, that's, that's just the cover story. We're just, we're here to get together and to remember that we're part of a, a very social species. Rene Dubois, uh, wrote a book back in the day before many of you were born um, that talked about uh, how mankind is a humankind is a social animal, a social species. And that was sort of news to people like, oh, really? 
that's interesting. What an interesting idea because we've been so isolated. So thank you for coming together for two hours. Wow. Good job. And holding your attention and holding space um, for Mars and for the future. Thank you. And uh, I hope that everyone can uh, visit the sites that that Lily and Tony and Jessica and Abby and, and Tyler have created. They have incredible information on their sites. They're really hard workers and let's continue to work hard. But as Abby says, let's, let's um, make sure we leave room for joy and community in our lives. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. This is great. Reoccupy Mars. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. I can't do that. It's hard. It's hard to do on a moment's notice. I'm the only one who can't do it. I don't belong. <laughs> you can, here, oh. I'll do that. The opposite. Good enough. That might be the Martian. Right. That might, who knows, you know. All right. Take care, Tony. Take care, Lily, Abby, Jessica. Good to see all of you. See you later. Thank you. Okay. Great Tyler. to be here. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.